All right, if y'all don't mind, I don't want to break up your conversation. I mean, you know, sometimes y'all act like you hadn't seen each other in years. <laughs> it's like, it's like, come on. All right, uh, look at Second Timothy. Just look at it. <laughs> no, 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 turn there, turn there. I just look at it. And uh, Aaron asked me tonight what chapter. I said the whole thing. I said no chapter. <laughs> but we're going to start chapter, we're going to start in chapter 2. I don't know where we'll end up, but 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Now, while you're turning there, um, you know, one thing about when you read the Bible and you come across names, it makes it very difficult to realize that there may be 8 or 10 or maybe 15 people that have been named by that name all through the Bible. So, you know, let's just give you an example. So if you're reading over there in the uh, Old Testament and you come up with a name like Ezra, of course, the one we think about is Ezra the scribe. But in reality, there may be as you read through the Bible and different, there may be four or five Ezra's mentioned in the Bible. And what happens is the normal mind will read that name and associate it with what's been uh, pressed in their life, whether by memory or by uh, experience. And in, in that case, we miss it. We miss it. Because each, I, I just came across this as Simon, the name Simon. Who do we think of? Simon Peter. There are seven Simons in the New Testament alone. Seven different Simons. I mean, so, I mean, we don't have any problem with that here. If I say um, uh, Ed, well, we'd say, those of us in this circle would think Ed Valancourt. But we know, we've known many Eds. In our lifetime. None so fine as Ed Valancourt. <laughs> but. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in there. But, uh, but I, I know I had an uncle named Ed. On my mother's side. And uh, I've known. I had a, a friend in school. Uh, in Jacksonville. His name was Ed. Uh, you remember old Ed? <laughs> oh Mr. Ed. Yeah. <laughs> fine show right there. <laughs> I mean, it was way ahead of its time, wasn't it? <laughs> Talking horses. But, uh, but we, we all have these uh, names. Simon, just give you an example. There's Simon the Pharisee. There's Simon the Sorcerer, found in the book of Acts. Of course, Simon the Leopard. That's another famous one. Over the book of Acts, there was one called Simon a Tanner. And then... The Lord Jesus mentioned in Matthew, Simon the Canaanite. And then one of my favorite Simons in the Bible is the one who came and carried the cross of the Lord Jesus. His name was Simon of Cyrene. And then, of course, Simon Peter. All those are come out of the New Testament. And uh, I'm sure there's probably some in the Old Testament, but these were just mentioned in the New Testament. There's seven Marys in the New Testament. Seven different Marys. And so I say all that because when, you, when we read uh, a passage in the Bible, it is so easy to connect different people that won't fit in that scenario, in that passage, but we connect them anyway. Uh, uh, you know, John. John the Baptist. Of course, John the Beloved. And then uh, all those, there's so many names in the New Testament. One time I want to do a thing on, on just names. So there's so many names. Uh, uh, much of our English, all of us are named pretty much from Bible names. English translations of Arabic names and uh, Hebrew names. Uh, pretty much everything we call our people up in the last 10 years now. You get some weird names out there now. I mean, I, I don't know where some of these names come from. I'd hate to be a kid 
today. No telling what your parents are going to name you. And, uh, you know, Johnny Cash had to have a boy named Sue. <laughs> well, there's some kids having a struggle with time their parents get out of the hospital with them. Those kids are going to have struggles all their life from what they call their child. <laughs> it's a crazy world we live in, and I guess they think we're crazy. But we, in turn, think the world's crazy. <laughs> but I, I, I want to give you some things found in 2 Timothy that reflect what Christians or believers are called. We're called by more names than just Christian. We've got, in, in fact, in this one chapter, there are seven names that a believer is called. And so we want to look at that tonight and uh, see if we can find anything uh, unusual. But uh, first, first, first name is found there in the very first verse of chapter number 2, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Uh, if you look there, it says, there, Thou therefore my son, <laughs> a son. I mean, think about that. Uh, you know, we go around saying, hey, son. <laughs> we say that, men will say that in a sort of a slang way. We don't really think everybody's our son. But it's kind of a, it, it's almost like if you're wanting to put somebody down, you go, hey, son, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you, you're, I'm, I'm old enough or I'm mature enough to be your daddy. And uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a put down, but uh, not with the people of God. It's not a put down at all with the people of God. In fact, uh, Galatians chapter six, uh, 4 says this, and because ye are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. I mean, one of the benefits of being called a son of God is the fact that we enjoy all of him, including the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which, uh, as has been spoken to me tonight, you can be driving down the road and be caught up in the Lord and the things that God's ministering to your heart, that is a badge of honor for a child of God because it's the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart and a lot of times calling you to mind things about the Lord and what He's taught you. And, and it's just a blessing of God going on uh, in the midst of a, a, a traffic jam. Thank God we need more of that blessing in these traffic jams. I saw uh, over in Tallahassee yesterday, uh, one of a, the state leaders of a, of a big department uh, had a shootout, got shot there in Tallahassee at a Tom Thumb, and it was road rage. So apparently these two guys, this state director, got mad. They didn't charge the guy that shot him because it was self-defense and they followed each other and pulled into Tom. You know, if somebody gets on my bumper like that and, and I can tell that they're not going to get off, I look for the closest sheriff's office <laughs> and just drive up there. They tend to get away <laughs> when you do that. There's one out here on Hood Drive. I know that by experience. Uh <laughs> I mean, for no reason they'll get mad at you if you don't take off at a red light just real fast. You know, they'll get you. And then uh, if you happen to uh, mess up and ch change lanes and you don't see them, they'll shoot you over that. I mean, it makes the wild west look tame, doesn't it, out here right now. But uh, one of the things that we can enjoy is, is being called a son which has all kind of ramifications. Here's what Romans said, For all who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. We're born again, uh, not of the flesh, nor the will of man, but by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Born, new, we're one of His children. Now you say, well, aren't we all, aren't we all children of God? According to the Lord Jesus as He walked on this earth, he said, 
to a group of folks, ye are of your father the devil. Uh, in reality, you're either born again or you're being run and governed and parroted by the devil. That's it. So first thing he mentions, first name to a Christian called son. He said, there, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then look at verse number three. We're called soldiers. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I mean, this is not the only place we find that. Remember what the Apostle Paul said? I fought a good fight. <laughs> I mean, hey, put on the whole armor of God. So it's not an unusual thing to be called a soldier as a child of God. But you know, when you think about a soldier, there's a lot of things that it, the connotation, it, it leads to kind of identify the type of lifestyle. A soldier is somebody who has voluntarily signed up for the most part. Uh, I know there's been a draft, but I haven't been a draft in 30, 40 years. But uh, it's somebody who says, I'll go. Now, a child of God, by his own will, makes a decision to follow the Lord Jesus. And the Lord didn't force me to. Uh, he didn't coerce me to. He called me, and I said, and you said, I'll trust you. So when you're called a soldier, you know that uh, nobody forced you into the Lord's army. You voluntarily went. And then you think about the other things. You're willing to go. A soldier doesn't know where he's going to go when you sign up. Now, my dad was in the service. He fought in uh, World War II and Korea. And uh, he, did, uh, he didn't ever talk about this, but he had a Purple Heart. He got shot there on the uh, beach of, uh, of uh, one of the islands. Uh, and he never said a word about it. And when he died, my mother said, you want his medals? And, I, and he never said it. He never showed his medals. He was one of the first hundred infantry. He got a medal for this. First hundred to hit the beaches of the Philippine Islands to liberate them. First hundred soldiers. Uh, never said a word. Uh, I did know, I noticed in his, when we go out fishing and, and uh, wading, catching bull men and stuff, he had a big hole there in his leg. He never explained it. He never said, I got shot. But that's where he was wounded. Big old hole about that big in his leg. Uh, he, he did, the only thing he had, he had a Japanese flag that had a hole in it. He kept it. And I remember even as a little kid, don't touch that flag. You weren't supposed to touch it. So uh, uh, as an Air Force brat, and I was born in the Philippines as a kid, Way back there when people enjoyed life, 1952. And, uh, and we moved. We lived in California. I, I've got on my um, um, Ancestry.com, I've got a, a ship's log. My mother came back from the Philippines on a ship. And I've got the log of that ship, and you can, you can read that log, and here's, here's Mark Cooley, three months old. <laughs> All that written in handwriting on the official log of that ship. It's got the name of the ship. I think it was, uh, I'd, I'd be afraid to say now, but I, but I had the ship's name. But it's funny, I looked at that and said, look at there. Somebody wrote my name down when I was three months old. But uh, we lived there. We lived, uh, we lived in... Eglin Air Force Base in Fort Walton. My sister's, my youngest sister was born there at Eglin, December 23rd, 1954. And uh, then we moved to Texas for a while. Spent some time in San Antonio. And then when he retired in 1961, we moved up to, we, before he retired, we spent the last 14 months in Griffiths Air Force Base, Rome, New York. And uh, I was about in the fourth grade. And uh, well remember all of it. It was a fascinating year. 
Roger Maris hit 61 home runs in 1961. And I remember we had a little black and white TV, and all the Yankee, and this was a dream for me. I was a baseball nut, you know, at that age. And we got the Yankee broadcast every night they played. And as far as I'm concerned, we could always stay in New York because you got to see the Yankees every night. And back then, I mean, that was a big heyday. Mantle was playing, and Moose Scourin was playing, and Tony Cooper. I mean, they had them all, you know. So then we left uh, New York, and he came down to Panama City and retired. But we didn't know, f and, and, and then he got shipped off when I was, when my mother uh, had four kids, uh, six years and under, and he got shipped to Germany for 13 months, and we weren't allowed to go because it wasn't a long enough stay right at 13 months. So we took him to the train station, you know, over here in Crestview. And I, I, knew, I knew my mother was crying. I didn't understand it at the time. I wasn't but four years old, but she was just a crying. I kept thinking, what's she crying about? Because <laughs> she's stuck with these kids by herself. <laughs> I mean, I can imagine four kids, four little darlings running around and the husband gone to Germany for over a year. But... Uh, and a hurricane hit that year. A massive hurricane hit down there. And uh, it was a pretty fascinating year. But I'm saying all this because we don't, a soldier doesn't know where you're going to end up. And we're called soldiers. And he said, endure hardness as a good soldier. So that's just another name the child of God's called. Then look there, if you would, in verse number 5. And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. He describes us as an athlete. That's what he's talking about. Somebody who, like an Olympian, who's attempting to win the gold medal, that's the masteries. If you are out there trying to win uh, in this area, uh, you, you, uh, you're described as that type of Christian. Somebody who who, uh, you know, it, isn't that what the apostle said in Hebrews? He said, I ran a good race. I run the race before you, therefore, put aside every sin that so, and weight that so easily besets you and run the race before you. And then he talks about the crown, the crown of life, which is a direct um, uh, mention that attaches to the, to the concept of being an athlete. Now, uh, a son, a soldier, an athlete. Three, three different phrases that describes or names that describes what we know as a Christian. But yet I don't think God put all this in here by the Holy Spirit for nothing. I think actually put it in there to give us some insight on how we ought to live our lives. Uh, we ought to be... Somebody who lives up to the name. Remember when you leave home, uh, you know, in your teenage years and your mom or dad, generally as your mother said, you better remember what your name is. You know, I, I remember hearing that all the time. Uh, you better remember who you belong to. You know, My, we had four kids, there four of us, and I remember people used to be kind of stunned. We'd come in somewhere and we'd all sit down on a pew. And people would say, boy, y'all's kids are really good. Well, if you knew what made us do that, you'd understand. <laughs> and then, I mean, I tell you what, my dad and mom would have blown a fuse out here today. They couldn't have handled it. Kids, I mean, you, we're not talking about the 1800s. We're talking about 1960. Kids were expected to be trained. And... Only every now and then you ran into a kid that was wild. For the most part, everybody's kids acted pretty good. And you, of course, you didn't go to restaurants. There really wasn't. It. I don't even remember. Only restaurant I remember was a, there was a, a, a place over here in Fort Walton. There's a place called Gardner Beach. It's on the bay. And on the way to Gardner's Beach, there was a, a shack on the corner of Racetrack Road and and Eglin Parkway. And it said eight hot dogs or six hamburgers for a dollar. You take your pick. 
Of course, if you got four kids and you try to feed them on the way to the beach or have you leave, that's where you went. You get eight hot dogs. And, uh, and then uh, McDonald's opened up and, and uh, they, you know, they had 400,000 sold, 450,000 was on their sign. And it wasn't a digital sign. It was they'd have to change it, you know. And my dad said, boys, one day me and my brother, he said, when that thing says a million, of course there wasn't a room for a million. When that thing says a million, I'm going to buy you a hamburger, french fries, and chocolate shake. He, in his mind, it wasn't ever going to happen because it only had room for nine figures, and it was, you know, uh, eight, you know, eight figures or something, six, uh, six figures and all, 600,000, 700. Well, one day we rode by there and it, they had changed the whole sign. It put 1.1,100,000 1, sold. So he had to get us. You know how much it cost for a hamburger, chocolate shake, and order fries? 50 cents. 54 cents with tax. Boy, things have changed. <laughs> you go up there right now, $8 <laughs> for nothing. And they're not, you're not even sure that hamburger is more than likely it's not cold. It's not hot. It's cold. The fries, you pick them up and they just bend over. You squeeze that bag and grease will run out of them. So things have not gotten better. They've gotten worse. So anyway, uh, that was the only thing, Mac McDonald's. And, 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 and if there were restaurants, and I'm sure there were, there was one on, uh, in Fort Walton called Staff's. It's been there all my life. But nobody I knew went to it. People didn't go out to eat, ever. I don't think we're better. <laughs> I mean, I'm at the point now where I'm reverting back. Hey, there's so many sorry meals out there in these restaurants. That it's getting absolutely hard to find a good, warm, right-cooked meal. So I, I, I've turned into one of these old guys where... Let's just eat at home. And Esther says, if you're cooking, we'll do it. <laughs> it's becoming a hobby of mine. I kind of enjoy it. But it really, most time, I'd say 95% of the time, whatever you get at home is better than anywhere else you get. Now, the only time you, you may find out a difference, you've got to pay big bucks to get a decent meal. That's pretty sorry, isn't it? But anyway... That won't change our lives. We'll still go out and get burnt. And, uh, <laughs> and I run into some of y'all from time to time out there, and we all look at each other. Uh, <laughs> what was yours, meal like? Sorry. <laughs> but uh, all that is, it, how'd that happen? Paul wrote on athletes, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I mean, that just shows you, I, there's much in the Bible concerning Christians being described as athletic people. Certainly it is somebody who exercises their way and, and uh, uh, trains, uh, reads their Bible, prays, studies the Word of God, gets prepared, because uh, people are going to ask you questions. If you talk to anybody out there about the Lord, you're going to have questions. They're going to have questions, I mean, of you. You're going to get them. And if you are a trained athlete, you'll have enough information to give an answer. doesn't have to be some theologically lengthy answer, but uh, it, we ought to know enough about the Bible that we can uh, uh, give a good answer. A good answer. So you got ask athletes. Now look at chapter 2, verse 6. It says, the husbandman that laboreth must first partake, be first partaker of the fruits. So he likens or names you another name as a farmer. That's a pretty weird thing when you think about it. You've gone from an athlete to a farmer. Of course, farmers work hard enough they're in shape to be an athlete. Uh, uh, farmers these days got a pretty nice, uh, uh, I like to see those big... Uh, tractors where they got the air condition inside you see them they got their xm radio <laughs> driving that thing and then you say boy i've been out in the field all day it's dusty that and a drop of dust entered that <laughs> that thing you know and but uh but it's still that's uh, they still work hard 
But truth is, if we're, uh, if we're the type of, uh, and live up to the name farmer, uh, we'll be planting and sowing the seed. And that's the way it ought to be. And then verse number 6, it says, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruit. So we've got to, uh, we've got to harvest the fruit. We've got to pick the fruit. Now, uh, there's more in the Bible about fruit than just winning someone to Christ. That is fruit. But at the same time, you've got the fruit of the Spirit, which is where your life uh, actually portrays the fruit that God produces in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentle, kindness, meekness, temperance, those things. So a, a farmer sows the seed, enjoys the harvest, and lets it produce in his life uh, Christ-like. And then uh, the next one quickly is chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So we're, we're actually described as a vessel, a jar, a container. Of course, there's all kind of sizes and shapes and, and material that a vessel's made out of. But one thing about it, in every civilization from the beginning of man, uh, a vessel played the, uh, the most important role in the life of a community. Uh, as the archaeologists dig up these remains from 2,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago during these Bible lands, inevitably every one of them run across broken vessels. Uh, pottery made, clay made, jars and containers. And it, it, in fact, if you were a vessel, a potter, in Bible days, you were an important of a fluent person for the most part. I mean, if you knew that skill, because everybody had to have a vessel now. We, we don't even think about vessels anymore today because everything's throwaway. You got, comes packaged container, you know, and, you know, uh, your, your Tupperware stuff, you know, it's, it's just dime a dozen. But a vessel in most of human civilization, in most of all of the uh, 4,000 to five to 6,000 years, was, was a work of art that had to be produced. And so as a child of God, we're called a vessel. God works on us. Uh, he molds us and makes us. Mold me and make me after thy will is the song. And uh, that's a name that we got. We've been given that. It's not somebody thinking about it. It's actually said as a vessel, as a vessel. And then lastly, look at chapter 2, verse uh, 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. So we're called a servant. That means it is not our will, but His will. If we're a servant of the Lord, if we're a servant of the Lord, we seek to honor and please our Master. And uh, the vessel was supposed to be meat for the Master's use. And so it gives you a, a, a semblance of how we're uh, looked at from heaven and what God expects us to be by giving all the names in one chapter of what he describes his people. Now, as I mentioned, uh, names in the Bible, you'll find many names for different people. But for the child of God, there's seven right there. Let's bow our heads if you would. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to come tonight. We pray the Holy Spirit of God would... Uh, use the Word of God in our life to make us be who we ought to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.